Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining this session. The session, as the name says, is quite interesting. I'm quite looking forward to it. Our speaker, Mr. Sanjeev Augustine, is here with us and he'll take us through the session. Over to you, Sanjeev. Thank you very much, Priyanka, and welcome, everybody. So I really appreciate you joining me here. I'm actually broadcasting from Washington, D.C. in the United States. And the, I want to begin with a question um, to all of you. So I've been doing Agile for a long time. It's actually about uh, over 20, 20 years. So I want you to tell me, if you could please take a look at the chat, tell me your level of Agile experience. If you're novice, just put in a number one. If you're intermediate, number two, and if you're uh, three expert. Okay, so I can see them come up over here. We got some number threes, a uh, couple of twos, not set. Uh, well, okay, fantastic. Uh, so lots of number twos, no, no real like super new to agile uh, novices. And I think that's, that's a great distribution because it makes my job easier. I can target what I'm uh, talking about to a slightly higher level in that uh, you guys are between um, a higher level of maturity. Okay, next question for you. And this is, this is a dated question because we're, this is sort of a generational um, reference over here. What does the phrase license Raj mean to you? Who's familiar with that? And if you do, if you could just pop that in the chat. Command and control, Shamir says that, fantastic. Uh, any other interpretations of license Raj? Authority, government controls, yes. And could be controls in general, right? So controls, Arundhati says she has no clue. Yeah, bureaucracy, monopoly, absolutely. So these are things that used to exist in Australia, no meaning. Okay, yeah. so these are things that used to uh, exist when in uh, in India, there was a socialist economy, right? And there wasn't a lot of free market competition, and therefore there were there was a heavy level of bureaucracy that the government used to put in place, mainly to sort of stifle business, right? And that uh, was perhaps well intentioned, but really made things go wrong, right? Exactly, red tape, bureaucracy, control, and this was the reason why. There was a time in India that you could just get maybe two or three um, uh, types of cars. Uh, uh, and you, you had to wait five years or 10 years for, to get a telephone. So many things that were freely available in free market economies were not, just not there in, a, in that type of uh, license for our system. And the, the reason it was such a controlled bureaucracy was that if you needed anything, you just had to go to um, bureaucrat after bureaucrat and get uh, permission or um, a license, literally stamp for license for pretty much everything. Believe it or not, there was even a license at one point for to ride a bicycle. Uh, I kid you not. So next question for you, a license Raj is, you know, if I put, I would sort of put it out there, is just rules gone crazy oh stifling rules you know stifling bureaucracy that bring grinds everything down um to a halt so here's another question many of you are two and three um here's the question for you can the rules be good can rules be good in an agile ecosystem we don't want a license raj we don't want a bureaucracy we don't want a command and control waterfall legacy type uh, uh, uh regime, if you will. And Sam, yes, the term originally, the Raj, term Raj came from the British, but it was also uh, sort of appropriated uh, into the Indian way of working. So yes, uh, so Gautam says, uh, yes, God rails some rules to organize, yes, in the form of uh, the extents. Yes, so it depends on the rules. So rules can be good, right? And here is a quote that is one of my favorites. I've been quoting it for a long time. It comes from D. Hawk. He was the chairman of Visa International. And he says that complex rules and regulations give rise to simple, stupid behavior. And that's the license rush. And that's un unfortunately when we have bureaucracy where, and when you have an over, mm, um, over ponderance of rules or over stifling uh, over, you know, too many rules, you're just going to end up with a license raj and this stupid, simple and stupid behavior. But if we can have simple generative rules, that's what we want, right? Maybe very based on the, on the nature of the teams, doesn't increase complexity. Yes, we want to have that 
a simple set of rules that are generative in na nature that we can adapt as we go along, right? And that's the nature of the game. Okay, so with that preamble, I am going to now jump into my presentation and show you a few slides. And we'll go through some slides over here. Let's keep these, keep it interactive. If you want to keep the questions coming, um, please keep them coming so that I can see what's going on. And um, we can, um, we can, I can answer them as we go along. All right. So what really happens from when you move from a licensed lodge and we say we, we don't want a bureaucratic system and we want a agile system where things are free, things are generative, and we can have a simple set of rules. And so we try to set that up, but what we intend to happen doesn't really happen that often. And so what we have to figure out is how do we handle a situation where when we move towards a non-licensed Raj, a free set of generative rules, what should happen and what really happens and how can we close the gap between that? What should happen with simple generative rules? What really happens, intended or not, and then how to close that gap. So quick uh, note about my company, it's called Lightspeed. We're a agile training consulting and management consulting company based here in the Washington DC area. And uh, we actually help clients all over the United States and, and internationally. So uh, we're hiring, by the way, if you're interested in agile coaching, agile consulting, please send your uh, resumes into jobs at lightspeed.com. Little word about myself. I've been doing this thing for a long time. I'm the founder and CEO of Lightspeed and um, lots of my interests are there, travel, world cultures, music, etc. I've been doing this Agile stuff for a while. I have a, a podcast, it's called Agile Caravan Sarai. You can go to our website. Uh, lightspeed.com and check it out and been writing for a long time was just watching Naresh talk about his conference uh, the Agile India conference starting in 2005 and my first book came out in 2005 um, managing agile projects and my third book from PMO project management office to VMO just came out this year in September so do check it out because some of the concepts I'm going to talk about are from there right so um what I want to uh, submit to you is that traditional governance has been problematic. Right? When we've had large organizations, when we've had bureaucratic organizations, and, and especially when we... ...waterfall type of governance, we've run into problems, right? And so I am now going to play for you a clip from a few years ago when the US government was trying to implement a website. And this is for the healthcare system, it's called healthcare.gov. And some of you might've seen in the international news that this entire system that was meant to support millions of people was developed. And after three years, when they tried to take, almost three years, when they tried to take it live, after spending something like 500 million US dollars, it, it crashed and you saw some of these issues with scheduled slippages, cost increases. So I'm, I'm gonna play a video, uh, excuse me, an audio clip and I'll keep the slide up. And just, uh, I'd like you to just kind of listen to this. President Obama is putting former CEO Jeff Zients in charge of the tech surge. That's the administration's emergency effort to fix the healthcare website. But what about the contractors who built it? What's their responsibility? And Piers Martin Costi has this profile of CGI Federal, the IT company that handled the biggest piece of the project. You may have never heard of CGI, but in its hometown of Montreal, it's a big deal. It's an IT outsourcing company that got started a number of years ago with a couple of guys in Quebec City who didn't even speak English. Carl Moore is a business professor at Montreal's McGill University, and he knows the company well. They've gone from those humble roots, uh, and then started to grow, and they grew a lot through acquisition. CGI is now Canada's biggest tech company, and it sells IT services around the world. Moore says the company has a good reputation, but there have been some problems. Just last year, the province of Ontario fired CGI for failing to deliver a healthcare-related IT project on time. Some in Washington now wonder whether CGI's American subsidiary, CGI Federal, deserves the blame for fumbling the Obamacare project. Sanjeev Augustine doesn't buy it. I think it's grossly unfair. I think they're a victim of their circumstances. Augustine is president of Lightspeed LLC, a training and software development company in Washington. 
He says federal rules require projects to be divvied up among too many contractors, in this case 54 other companies besides CGI. The idea is to spread the wealth and avoid overcharging, but he says it's no way to build software. What folks attempt to do is to use the same model, the Cold War model, if you will, to build a cruise missile to develop a you know, smaller software system, and it just doesn't work. He says software is best designed by small teams, and unlike a cruise missile, the whole project does not need to be ready at the same time. It's easier to put up a web portal in stages. That's what they did in Colorado. Cami Blay is the CFO for that state's health insurance market system, which went online the same time the federal one did. We knew that there would be some things that would be delayed in rolling out. There would be some enhancements, some you know customer decision tools that we would actually not be able to do until after go live. And Blay says there was only about eight contractors working on Colorado's system, and one company was clearly in charge. That company was another subsidiary of CGI. We trusted them to manage the other technology vendors that they were integrating, and we worked in a close partnership with them. That's in contrast with the federal website, where no one contractor was in charge. CGI Federal would not give NPR an interview, but in an email, a spokesperson said CGI was not the lead contractor. In fact, he says none of the companies was the lead, and none was capable of testing the system end-to-end. That responsibility was left to the government. Martin Costi, NPR News. All right. So there's an example of all the governance in the world. They really tried it, uh, tried to oversee. They tried to put in place a number of uh, governance rules, and it failed. And you see it fails because when we want to deliver things fast and when, when, when things are changing rapidly, the old regime doesn't work, right? That li- license Raj regime, in this case, the healthcare.gov government regime didn't work. So what we want to do to, is to talk about what does work. Right? And so I'm going to put three transitions, if you will, from a license Raj, a traditional waterfall legacy governments, governance type regime to a light touch governance. We still need rules. We still need simple generative, generative rules. We still need those rules to be light touch, keep those guardrails so that they can enhance rather than hinder. So these three things I want to put in front of you, and they might seem sort of innocuous, right? Short iterations, we'll talk about that. Small value stream aligned teams, we'll talk about that. And strategy linked to agile execution. But what about the governance aspect of that? Let's talk about that. Let's start with short iterations. Please put in the chat the length of your iterations. If you're doing Scrum or Safe or XP, how long are your sprints or iterations? Please put it as, are they two weeks? Yeah, so most folks are doing two weeks, right? So we say, well, Scrum says we have to deliver in time box sprints of two weeks. Fantastic, life is good. Second question, how many of you are actually delivering working tested product or working tested solutions, services at the end of every two weeks? Can you put that in the chat? Some, there's got to be someone here, all right? Most of the times, this yes, uh, fantastic. So a fewer number sometimes, right? At the end of three, or, yeah, so incremental mode, no. So we start to go down a slippery slope because we say we want to be able to deliver these product increments to customers rapidly. And we want to be able to do it in two weeks at the end of every sprint. And sometimes it takes longer. And here's what we're shooting for, right? What, we, what should happen is that Scrum and these Agile methods should give us a way to put, to break our larger pieces of delivery, larger pieces of our product, chunk them down into minimum marketable product, MMPs, those, those are the red things at the bottom. And if we're developing a, a new product, just like with Scrum is usually the sweet spot for, we might do two week sprints. And after in this example, after three, three sprints, we have an MMP that we can deliver to, uh, to release to our end customers and end users. So over a series of sprints, our features should coalesce into MMPs. And when those are ready, we can release. Now, if we if this is my, if these are minor enhancements, then maybe we can release after every sprint, right? This is the way it should work. We should have small batches that move rapidly through our system. They, they, they should flow through our system. Right? Now, what should also happen, 
and this is a case study, is that we should be able to overlay governance on top of that system, right? So if I have my delivery here in my sprints, I can then start to work backwards from that and say, okay, maybe I can do some discovery. I can do some elaboration of the epics and here's my program. <clears throat> I can take that waterfall book of work. This is an example from a customer where they had a waterfall system and we were moving them from that, from that uh, license Raj, if you will, to a more agile system and said, take that waterfall book of work, break those projects into smaller MMPs, put the MMPs in the product program backlog, prioritize them. We can do a call review. The C-A-R-L stands for compliance, audit, risk, and legal. Compliance, audit, risk, and legal upfront on all of the MMPs in the product, in the program backlog. We can have architectural review that anybody who's familiar with extreme programming will probably be aware of that. And then we can roll into our quarterly planning with our PI planning or big room planning, right? So here is an example of how we can take light touch governance, move from that you know, big license raj governance, have the proper generative rules, get legal review, get architectural review, get audit, get risk review and compliance, and then move into an iterative cycle or incremental cycle. Here again, we can have another call review as we're moving things into the sprints, right? So there's a high level review there, there's an ongoing iterative review. And then of course, there's a lot of XP stuff in terms of spikes and sprints, right? So this is the way it, this is the way it, um, it should work, right? Now, what really happens is something else. So when we try to do this, we end up with really long lead times at the beginning, both before and, and after development. And so some of you might recognize this pattern. We call it water scrum fall or scrum a fall or agile. Put, your, put a little yes or no if you've seen some of this, uh, this pattern play itself out. Now, with the advents, advent of DevOps, we've tightened this side, right? The downstream processes we've been able to release on demand, we're able to get a little handle at least on the technical side. But upfront, upstream, we still struggle with this. How can we get chunks on our business side, get our business partners to, be, to break down the, some, some of our product increments into chunks? And how can we flow things from end to end? Because what really happens in our organization is not the wonderful stuff that should happen. We get stuck with the remnant of that license Raj. You, we still have to go and get some approval on those, those requirements. We still have to get project feasibility. And then maybe we can get two weeks sprints in, in development, but if we're still facing regulations up here, upstream, and regulations when we have to do, deliver into, into production. Right? And so what really happens is that we still don't have a structured way to integrate that nice stuff I showed you all the compliance, audit, risk, and legal, and enterprise. And those things get in, 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 uh, neglected until it's way too late, right? And so you could have a discovery phase and development. So there you go, De development never starts, right? So that's not good. So what we need to do is to bring in those stakeholders and shift that interaction with those stakeholders left, shift our entire process so that we can go end to end and so that we can create what's known as an agile value management office. So I'm going to skip here and show you how we can pull together a cross-functional, cross-hierarchy team of teams that we call an agile value management office. So do me a favor and in do a, I want to do a quick tech check over here. Where's my chat? Yeah. Can you put in your chat whether you can see my video? Can you guys see my video? It's not playing yet, but okay. I'm going to start playing it. Okay. Uh, are there any other potential release changes that we need to the green card movement? So is this, uh, Jill, is this represent the the reconfigured board, is this the consolidation? This is the consolidation, except I would say that everything from 417 is actually correct. This is not correct because we need we need yeah, more weeks more over there. So let's I, know, I don't have more boards. Do we need, because uh, I'd like to take two minutes to talk about that, is do we need any further updates in the current iteration from any of the groups represented? Probably not, they need to go through their current. Yeah. So yes, they are planning out for more than the quarter. And what you have on the wall are work streams, 
the the roles are work streams there are mmps that are making their way from the yes this is it's it's not big room planning i'll tell you what it is in a second big room planning has everybody from the teams as well um and what what we have over here are a bunch of sprints so uh, each one of the columns are sprints this gentleman with his back to us is is um is a uh, executive um he's the it executive the gentleman who's sitting down here is a business executive and uh, give me a second uh the folks who are this, the lady who was at the uh at the at the uh board uh, she's the equivalent of a release train engineer if you're doing a save she's an rte if you're doing discipline agile or something else it she would be a chief scrum master and then th these are some of the senior members of this uh, this uh, agile value management office and then you got some team members here not all of them but some representatives so how is it different from safe this is the process is similar to say, but this organizational construct is different in that it pulls together people end to end across business and IT at the middle management level, right? And we have some other folks from the executives as well, executive teams, and we have team members. So let me go back into my PowerPoint and show you what is that the makeup of the organizational con uh, construct, which is that we're calling an agile value management office, right? So here, here we have it. Our goal is to create that seamless network organization. Can we go across the teams? Can we get flow of value across those teams? Now, generally things are getting stuck at the management level, right? Decision-making velocity gets stuck. So what we want to have is um, things moving quickly from start to finish. And the bottlenecks are usually above the teams. They're not at the team level. So what we want to do is get one or two people from the team. We'll get these to be elected. We get a couple of executives the business and IT, and then we have a cross-functional group, both business and IT. With, and if you look at that room, there's about 30 people or so. And they are looking at everything that's coming down the pike, and they're planning things on a regular basis. Now, is this a quarterly meeting? No, this is a, this is a weekly meeting. Sometimes they even do it um, twice weekly, twi uh, two times a week. And what they're doing, is there's, they're looking at things across the portfolio. This is mostly at the portfolio level. And somebody mentions that Atlassian's big picture gives a similar view. I'm sure it does. Uh, we've used Jira, um, Jira Align for this, Lean Kit, different tools, and you can look at it and look and make it all digital. Right. So we have this team of teams that can help us look across all all of this uh, all, all of the enterprise from end to end. Right. And I'll, um, this is not applicable to all kind. Actually, it is. So here's the interesting thing: that board that you saw had at least half of the projects were waterfall projects. So we were just managing the dependencies across both agile and waterfall projects. And so the important thing was that on the agile projects, we were able to break down the increments into smaller MMPs. For the waterfall projects, that wasn't possible because they weren't delivering product, they were delivering documents, right? So they were, it is a question of managing the dependencies as, okay, when, when are you guys gonna release? You'll release you know, three sprints into the, into the, everybody else's uh, release, so we'll we'll make sure that we can uh, uh, we we can make sure that we're pulling people in. Uh, why not have all team members? Uh, because twice a week, once a week, it's it's uh, we still have big room planning for that. And there is something called cognitive low load. If you look at there's a great book and body of work out there that's called um, Team Topologies, and we just can't have, it doesn't make sense to bring everybody for every single meeting. It's not productive, right? So what we want to have, have there is a representative group of people who can, who can remove the impediments and make decisions and move things along. And that reduces the cognitive load on the, on the people on the teams. We still have representatives from the teams. And so the, their work is represented there. And that allows us to control cognitive role and just the mechanics become easier when we have rep representation like this. Okay. And uh, this is more than one project. This was 21 teams and it is a whole portfolio to Sam's question. All right. So how are we doing? We got about 20, 20 minutes. Um, and I, let me see. Any other questions? Did I not? I think I answered all of the other. Any other questions that you want to pop in the chat? This is, this is saying, okay, we want two-week sprints or iterations. We want to overlay governance on top of that. We want to make, make sure that we have in that room people from compliance, audit, risk, legal, vendors, and 
in addition to all of our program and project and product management folks, as well as some team members, as well as some executives. Right? And that allows us to manage the dependencies from end to end and make sure that we can have the right audit uh, audit uh, points, the right compliance point, and all the, the, the proper type of governance. And this is a light, light touch governance because it intrinsically is an agile way of doing that. So we're bringing in all of the non -agile, historically non-agile folks into an agile way of working. All right, um, next question for you guys. What is a value stream? I see that folks are familiar with SAFE here. So what is a value stream? Anyone know what a value stream is? Yeah, business value, right? So sequence of activity, there Ram Nath's got it, right? It's a sequence of activities from start to finish. So if we say that all Agile methods or all of Agile is based on Lean, right? And Lean says, we have to anchor what we do on the around the customer. So how can we go from customer through all any an idea that we have uh, of value that we have to deliver exactly, Pradeep says it, value that we're delivering to customers, so the initial idea through all of our silos and back again, and that sequence of set or sequence of activities is, is what we call a value stream. Now, if you're taking a UX perspective, user experience perspective, you say, well, a customer is going to go through some a journey. And what we want to do then is to line up that value stream along the customer journey. And then what we say is that I can align my teams to that customer journey or to the uh, value stream, the sequence of activities. And then what I can do is I can line up the MMPs, the minimum marketable products, line them up, and my team can work on one MMP at a time. So now I have my stable teams. I can take this collection of teams and I can align them to this the journey, a customer journey of the value that we're delivering to our customers, right? So this is what should happen. What should also happen is then I, if I'm applying, applying lean portfolio management, it's another case study where we've applied a portfolio Kanban, right? A Kanban is a big visual system or a big visual sign. And what we want to do is to control the flow of value. This is all pre-developed development, right? So this is all that upstream stuff we were talking about. And in this case, you have a funnel selection, prioritization, program backlog, and then we implement it. The way it gets manifested here is that all value is linked back to a obje uh, an objective or and key result we have everything in this row linked to this first OKR, objective and key results. Everything in the second row linked back up to the uh, the second uh, to the second OKR. And then what we want to do is to make sure that we're going through business requests, uh, wish diff ranking. If you're familiar with the safe estimation, um, uh, business case approved and selected, right? And so yes, we we do PI planning, but is all the work visible at all uh, at all times because pi planning is you know is, is about taking the stuff that's here in the right mode and start figuring out how to implement it and what i'm talking about is all the stuff upstream of pi planning and again at each one of these junctures we can have compliance audit risk legal we can have re uh, regulatory compliance we can have business compliance we can have all of our governance introduced over here all right so this is our portfolio Kanban. This is what should happen. But what really happens is that the organizational, uh, organizational silos still persist. It turns out that just to go from start to finish, we, we, we have to traverse about nine silos. So most organizations still look like this. Right? So yes, we need that you know, wonderful flowing portfolio, if you will. But our organizational still, still looks like this. And decisions are not swift because we have a hierarchy. So we have a lead time lag, right? So we have lag in going from start from left to right, but we also have a lag in decision velocity or decision lag. And that's because of the hierarchy. And that's another reason why we want to have that agile value management office, because in that agile VMO, we can expedite decisions and make sure that they get done quickly, right? Because we have horizontally, if you will, we have an issue going left to right, getting value to our customers. And then vertically, we have a lag in terms of decision-making velocity, right? And so what we need to do is to shift left and integrate end-to-end -end with business, 
And so here's what we want to do. Those value stream teams, right? Let's align them to a particular product. And let's talk about discovery, refinement, delivery, so that all the work that's coming, so that stuff you saw up front on that portfolio Kanban, that's here. Then there's some refinement and there's delivery. So this is a program Kanban. And you can see this quarterly planning here, this monthly planning here, and there's delivery every two weeks. So what we've done now is that we can take all this work and we can regularly feed it into our teams. If you're doing the scaled agile framework, then we'll collect those teams and into a group and call them an art. And then we'll take uh, agile release train and then we'll align those agile release trains to a value stream team, right? Or to a value stream, excuse me. But this is what we wanna do from end to end. And this is how we, we go from end to end from business to IT and back. So even if you have a legacy organization with those nine silos, we can now make, make sure that things are flowing or streaming, all right? So here's another case study where we had strategy, organizational units, the objectives and key results laid out, all the in demand coming into the VMO, the VMO doing big room planning, and the value stream owners, in this case, sales, uh, customer service, and marketing. Okay, so there you go. Best case, absolutely. This is what should happen, happen right? <clears throat> so I'm going to ask you guys, what are some simple ways that you can implement light touch governance? Right? So I would like you to please go to, uh, let's see, I'm going to see if I can pop that into chat. Let's stop sharing. And uh, where did my PowerPoint go? Uh, please go to menti.com. And I would like you to pop into menti.com some ways that you can implement light touch governance as we've been talking about over here. All right. All right. Some folks are already here. That's fantastic. Let me share the screen so that you guys can see what's happening. Build relationships, follow up, value stream mapping, excellence, quicker decision making, disperse. Yeah, awesome stuff. Follow up, but let the team do it. Less hierarchy, OKRs, team definition of done, org restructuring focus. Yeah, all great ideas. Thank you so much. So I appreciate that input. We need we need to make sure that in order to make the right decisions, to make sure we're building the right thing, and to make sure that what we're building meets business outcomes that our strategy is linked to agile execution, right? And this is what should happen. We should have a clear chain of why. Why are we working on this? Everything on that wall that we just saw should be linked back to a strategic outcome at, that is captured by an objective and a key result. So we'll have themes and those objectives will be there. And then we'll have initiatives and we'll have key results for each one of the initiatives under the themes. So we, we should have OKRs that drive all of our epics and our stories, right? This is what should happen. Now, what really happens is that that stuff just doesn't happen. Execution falls short of strategy, and you can see the failure <coughs> that we may have the greatest strategy, but uh, execution falls short, right? And 82% of Fortune 500 CEOs feel that their organization is effective at strategic planning, but only 14% say that they're actually implementing. And 50% say in the Harvard Business Review that say that strategies fail, fail to deliver those results because of poor execution or poor linkage to execution. So what really happens is two things. One is the strategy itself is unclear. And the second is the strategy is disconnected from execution. So we might be doing great stuff on the ground with our agile teams, but if we don't have the right direction, if you're not building the right thing and we're not linked to moving the needle on the right business outcomes, then we're, we're just generating a lot of waste. We're doing things that are not really valuable to the organization. And so it's really important from the get-go to have that North Star and to make sure that we're defining all the work, making it visible as MMPs, and then tying those minimum market and products or MMPs back to the OKRs to make sure that we can actually deliver value. So how do we do that? Here you see is an example of a case study where we have our OKR, we have epics that are lined up with those OKRs, they have features, and then the collection of those features, here's one, two features that are bundled into this MMP, here's another MMP, MMP here, and both of these MMPs clearly link back to this epic, which clearly link back to an OKR. And of course, you can do all of this stuff in, in, in your tool, right? Whether it's Jira Alliance, your big picture, or LeanKit, 
this is what we should be able to do. Now, what really happens is that we are unable to do this. So we need to make sure that we can define this clear chain of why. And here's how we go from top to bottom. Capture the strategy with, an OK, with OKRs in some sort of strategy capture session. Make sure we can do value stream mapping, align the teams by value, link the value streams back to the each OKR. And then in our BRP, a big room planning, or before, make sure that we can, we can align and link all of the work in process, all of those MMPs back to each OKRs. So to go from, from a strategy to value stream, and then all of the agile work in terms of epics, features, and stories, all linked from from in a chain and at any point in the chain, whether it's an epic or a feature or a story within the product backlog or higher up the chain, whether it's an initiative or a theme in the portfolio backlog, we should be able to work on it and say, why are we working on this? Well, it's because of this, uh, this OKR and this key result. So that clear chain of why is, is very important. So here's what we are talking about, just to pull it all together. Uh, three transitions, to light touch governance, those short iterations with integrated oversight and governance, the value stream uh, team with the value management office of VMO overseeing it and making sure that everything is being delivered end to end. And then the third one is strategy linked to the Agile ex execution, All right? So I am actually gonna stop sharing now because we got about five minutes and I wanna use that time productively for questions. So, at what time, Sandhya wants to know, what, at what time a tech team should be involved? Right from the beginning. That, the, the tech team members, you're going to have a couple of those members in that Agile VMO. And they're going to be involved with from the very beginning. Right on that left-hand side where I saw, I, I talked about program planning. So tech teams members are going to be involved from the very beginning. Maybe a tech lead, maybe a tech you know, could be a, 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 a developer, maybe a business analyst, but they might be going once a week to that Agile VMO meeting, All right? Operations, yes, everybody should be involved, right? Operations, end to end, we need operations, we need deployment, we need production folks, on, that's downstream. Upstream, we need our business partners. And when I say business, it's not just product managers, but it's sales, it's operations, it's marketing, HR, right? Legal, everybody should be involved end to end. Sanjeev, we How have a longish question on Q&A. Oh, I haven't looked at the Q&A. Sorry. Let's take a look at the Q&A. Mm. Organizational started starting with spike and review for new features <laughs> to get approvals. Uh, oh, that, which is very, uh, very interesting, right? The idea of a spike is that it's an experiment and it, you shouldn't have to get approval. It's like, I need three days. To go to go off and and to experiment with this. So the the reason you do a spike is so that you don't have to get an approval. So I'm sorry that your organization is uh, uh, is is doing that, but they're doing it wrong. So just show them. Go to go to extremeprogramming.org, e x t r e m e programming.org, and you're going to find uh, the explanation of a of, of a spike. Could be technical spike, could be business spike, and there's nothing about getting approval over there. In fact, the idea of the a spike is to help you get through any sort of jam pack. Right. Uh, what's the difference between MVP and MMP? And MVP is another experiment; it's a product experiment. We just want we want to try something. It's not ready for production because we're just going to try it. It's an experiment. An MMP is a piece of an actual product that is going into into production. How does a business move from ROI to OKR? It's not, not an easy task, I hope. Uh, you don't. You could still measure ROI, but uh, OKRs, objectives, and key results are pretty straightforward. There's, um, you know, there's a lot of work out there with, in terms of OKRs. Uh, you could still measure ROI, so you don't necessarily have to move from R R R ROI to OKRs. You can implement uh, uh, OKRs in addition to that. Okay. So we got about two minutes. Um, do you see any conflicts with multiple groups while defining the strategy? Yes, which is why they don't define the strategies. If you remember, I said they capture the strategy. The, stra the strategy is defined by the executives. In that triangle I showed you, there's the teams, then there's the Agile VMO, and above that, there's an executive action team. And the, action, the executive action team, the executives, they define the strategy, 
and then they say this is this is how the strategy uh, this and then the agile VMO has helped them capture a strategy with OKRs. Parts of the organization which don't embrace an end-to-end -end or bottleneck, this needs to be fixed by CEO, yes, uh, or at least somebody up the, up the, at that chain. How can you reduce the work effort across the work value stream, get people talking, set up those end-to-end -end teams, implement all three of these steps? This is all about reducing work efforts, reducing decision-making time, uh, and reducing the lead time so that we can go quickly from end-to-end. -end. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. It has been an amazing session, and I have learned quite a lot. Uh, from the chat, from the other conversations, it seems a lot of people have taken away a lot of insights from what you said. Thank you so much.